Welcome. Welcome, foolish mortals, to our radio drama Halloween special presentation of Young Frankenstein. Please note that this is a live performance, and the cast has had no rehearsals together, so there may be occasional stumbles in the dialogue. There's no turning back now. Oh, I didn't mean to frighten you prematurely. The real chills come later. We are expecting to have a lot of fun and hope you will too. And now, please enjoy Young Frankenstein. An elderly man carrying a small ornate metal box quietly enters a lecture hall packed with medical students. Class is already in session. If we look at the base of the brain, which has just been removed from a skull, there's very little of the midbrain that we can actually see. Yet, as I demonstrated in my lecture last week, if the under aspects of the temporal lobes are gently pulled apart, the upper portion of the stem of the brain can be seen. This so-called brain stem consists of the midbrain, a rounded protrusion called the pons, a stalk tapering downwards called the medulla oblongata, which passes out of the skull through the foramen, magnum, and becomes, of course, the spinal cord. Are there any questions before we proceed? I have one question, Dr. Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein. I, I beg your pardon? My name. It's pronounced Frankenstein. But aren't you the grandson of the famous doc Dr. Victor Frankenstein, who went into graveyards, dug up freshly buried corpses, and transformed dead components into that... Yeah! Yes, yes, we all know what he did, but I'd rather be remembered for my own small contributions to science, and not because of my accidental relationship to a famous cuckoo. Now, if you don't mind, can we have your question? Oh, uh, well, sir, I'm not sure I understand the distinction between reflexive and voluntary nerve impulses. Very good. Since our lab work today is a demonstration of just that distinction, why don't we proceed? The professor taps a bell, and a feeble old man is wheeled into the room on a gurney. Mr. Hilltop here, with whom I have never worked or given any prior instruction to, has graciously offered his service for this afternoon's demonstration. Mr. Hilltop, would you hop on up to your feet and stand beside the table? Mr. Hilltop slowly pulls himself to his feet. Slowly. Mr. Hilltop, would you raise your left knee, please? Mr. Hilltop raises his left knee, please. You have just witnessed a voluntary nerve. It begins as a stimulus from the cerebral cortex, passes through the brainstem, and then to the particular muscle involved. Mr. Hilltop, you may lower your knee. Mr. Hilltop may lowers his knee. Reflexive movements as these, which are made independently of the will, but are carried out along pathways, which pass between the peripheral nervous system and central nervous system, which pass between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system, you filthy, rotten son of a bitch! The professor abruptly raises his knee to Mr. Hilltop's crotch, and the test subject reacts accordingly. We are not aware of the impulses, neither do we intend them to carry out our contraction of the muscles. Yet, as you see, they work by themselves. But if we block this impulse by simply applying local pressure, which can be done with an ordinary metal clamp, just as the swelling of the posterior nerve root for, oh, say, five or six seconds. 
He holds up a bicycle clamp and then places it behind Mr. Hilltop's ears. Hilltop stands up a bit straighter, staring directly ahead. The professor looks at his watch. Why, you mother-grabbing bastard! He once again jerks his knee close to Mr. Hilltop's balls. But this time, Hilltop doesn't move. As you can see, all communication is shut off. Mr. Hilltop starts to go cross-eyed. In spite of our mechanical magnificence, if it were not for his conscious stream of motor impulses, we would collapse like a bunch of broccoli. He removes the clamp from Mr. Hilltop's head, and the elderly man collapses like a bunch of broccoli. The students applaud. In conclusion, it should be noted. The professor whispers to his assistant as they collect Hilltop. Give him an extra dollar. Extra dollar, yes, sir. He continues addressing the class. That more than common injury to the nerve root is always serious. Because once a nerve fiber is severed, there is no way in heaven or earth to regenerate life back into it. Are there any more questions before we leave? Y yes, Dr. Frank... Frankenstein. Yes? Isn't it true that Darwin preserved a piece of vermicelli in a glass until, by some extraordinary means, it actually began to move with voluntary motion? Are you speaking of the worm or the spaghetti? Why, the worm, sir. Yes, uh, it seems to me I did read something about that incident as a student. But you have to remember that a worm, with very few exceptions, is not a human being. But wasn't that the basis of your grandfather's work, sir? I mean, the reanimation of dead tissue. My grandfather was a very sick man. But as a Frankenstein, aren't you the least bit curious about it? Doesn't bringing back life, what bringing back to life, what once was dead, have any intrigue for you? We're talking about the nonsensical ravings of a lunatic mind. Dead is dead. But look at what's been done with the heart and kidneys. Hearts and kidneys are tinker toys. I'm talking about the central nervous system. But, sir, I... I'm a scientist, not a philosopher. He holds up a scalpel. You have more chance of reanimating the scalpel then you have a mending a broken nervous system. But what about your grandfather's work, sir? My grandfather's work was doo-doo. I'm not interested in death. The only thing that concerns me is the preservation of life. On the word life, he slams his fist into his thigh, forgetting that he is still holding the scalpel. He momentarily removes his hand, glancing at the handle then covers it up again, maintaining his composure as he casually crosses his legs, obscuring both his tool and the scalpel. Class is dismissed! As the students file out of the room, the man with the ornate box approaches the lecturer. Dr. Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein. My name is Gerhard Volkstein. I have traveled 5,000 miles to bring you the will of your great-grandfather, Baron Borford von Frankenstein. That evening, Dr. Frankenstein stands on a train platform with a woman who looks like she's about to attend the Met Gala. Oh, my sweet darling, my dearest love, I'll count the hours that you're away. Oh, darling, so will I. He leans in toward her. Not on the lips. I'm going to a party at... Going to that party at Nana and Nikki's later. I don't want to smear my lipstick. You, you understand? You understand? Of course. A conductor sounds from the train platform. All aboard! Oh, dear. Well, I guess this is it. Freddy, darling, how can I say in a few minutes what's taken me a lifetime to understand? 
Won't you try? All right. You got it, mister. I'm yours, all of me. What else can I say? My sweet love. He goes to lovingly put his hands on her face. There, just been set. Sorry. I hope you like old-fashioned weddings. I prefer old-fashioned wedding nights. Oh, you're incorrigible. Does that mean you love me? You bet your boots it does. Oh, my only love. He embraces her. Taffeta, darling, taffeta. Taffeta, sweetheart. No, the dress is taffeta. It wrinkles so easily. Off, off, off. Freddy steps away from her. Oh. All aboard. There's that horrid man again. Oh, well, hurry now before I make a fool of myself. He takes her by the hand. Ah, my nails! He lets go and then starts to lean in for a, a kiss again before stopping himself. After a moment's consideration, he offers her a 2020 elbow bump, which she then accepts. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, dearest Freddy. Freddy boards the train and looks back as the train starts moving. Darling! He blows her a kiss, which she frantically dodges. <gasps> she kisses her hand and holds it up, not quite tossing the kiss his way, and coughs as she <coughs> chokes on the train's steam. Later, Freddy reads a book in the passenger car. Harry, he was at it again. So what do you want me to do about it? Every day. Let him, let him. New York next, everyone out for New York. After transferring trains, he continues reading. Harold has Hartsfield Garden. What should I do as a dark garden turn? Yet tag. Last in, last in. Transylvania night. The Jeder Augustine for Transylvania. As the train grinds to a halt, Freddy looks out the window and sees a young boy dressed in lederhosen and with a shoe shine kit on his back. Pardon me, boy. Is this the Transylvania station? Yeah, yeah. This is the track 29. Oh, uh, can I give you a shine? Um, no thanks. Freddy disembarks and walks out of the train station. He places his suitcase and briefcase down as he surveys the foggy area. After a moment, he hears a heavy footstep, followed by a saf soft dragging noise that gets progressively closer. Dr. Frankenstein? Freddy turns around and is startled by the motionless JPEG of a man in a black cloak with a hunched back and misaligned eyes less than a foot away from him. Frankenstein. You're putting me on. No, it's pronounced Frankenstein. And do you also say Froderick? No, it's Frederick. Well, why is it Froderick Frankenstein? Froken, Frankenstein. It's not. It's Frederick Frankenstein. I see. You must be Igor. Uh, no, it's pronounced Igor. They told me it was Igor. Well, they were wrong then, weren't they? Uh, you were sent by her Falkstein, weren't you? Yes. My grandfather used to work for your grandfather. How nice. Of course, the rates have gone up. Of course. I'm sure we'll get along splendidly. He pulls his he puts his hand on what he initially believes is Igor's shoulder, then quickly recoils as he realizes Igor's left shoulder is not the same size as his right shoulder. Oh. Sorry, uh I you know, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm a rather brilliant surgeon. Perhaps I can help with that hump? What hump? Let's go! He goes to pick up his suitcase, but Igor steps ahead of him. Allow me, master. Thanks very much. 
Igor tries to pick up the suitcase, but finds it is too heavy for him. So he takes Freddy's other, smaller bag. Walk this way. He pulls out a short cane and uses it to get down the station stairs before handing the cane off to Freddy. This way. Freddy uses the cane for half of the stairs before realizing the absurdity and then walks normally. They approach a hay-filled cart drawn by two horses. I think you'll be more comfortable in the rear. When Freddy throws his suitcase into the cart, a voice is heard. Oh. What was that? Oh, that'll be Inga. Air Falkenstein, Air Falkenstein thought you might need a laboratory assistant temporarily. Freddy climbs onto the side of the cart, peers inside, and sees a large-breasted woman lying in the hay. Hello! Would you like to have a roll in the hay? It's fun! Roll, roll, roll in the hay. Igor gets into the driver's seat and cracks a whip. As the cart is pulled forward, the momentum causes Freddy to fall into the cart. After a while, Inga stops rolling and sits beside Freddy, moving particularly close when lightning flashes through the sky and a loud clap of thunder is heard. Sometimes I'm afraid of the lightning. It's just an atmospheric discharge. Nothing to be afraid of. A howl is heard coming from a nearby tree line. Werewolf! Werewolf? There. What? Igor points at the tree line. There, wolf. He then points up the road. There, castle. Why are you talking that way? I thought you wanted to. No, I don't want to. Suit yourself. I'm easy. Igor points up the road again at a large castle on the top of a hill. Well, there it is. Home. When they arrive, Igor climbs out of the cart and goes to the gigantic double doors, each of which has a large metal ring hanging on them. He slams one of the rings against the door, creating a loud, booming sound. Meanwhile, Freddy marvels at the rings as he helps Inga out of the cart. What knockers! Oh, thank you, Doctor! They join Igor at the door as it creaks open, and a stern-looking woman greets them. I am Frau Blucher. <laughs> steady! Steady! How do you do? I'm Dr. Frankenstein. This is my assistant, Inga. Uh, may I present Frau Bloucher? <laughs> I wonder what's gotten into them. Your rooms have been prepared. Our doctor, if you will follow me. I go, please bring the bags as soon as you're finished, please. Yes, master. After you, Frau Bloucher. <laughs> The trio enter the castle. Igor follows soon after, but glances back at the horses just before walking inside. Bluha! <laughs> the inside of the castle is more stoic than grand. There is a suit of armor beside the door, decorative weapons on the walls, and little in the way of furniture. The area is well lit by both a large fireplace and a candle-filled chandelier. Frau Blucher... <laughs> the, the Frau picks up an unlit candelabra and leads them up a flight of stairs with no railing. That is an OSHA violation. Yes, this castle used to belong to Jeff Bezos. Follow me, please. Stay close to the candles. The staircase can be treacherous. She takes them all to a large room with a bed and many bookcases. 
On the wall, there is a painting of a man with a subdued smile who bears a striking resemblance to Freddy. This is your room. It was your grandfather Victor's room. I see. Well, there does seem to be quite a few books. This was Victor's, the Baron's, medical library. And where is my grandfather's private? Private what? Well, these books are all very general. Any doctor might have them in his study. I, I don't seem to know what you mean. This is the only library I know of, Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Well, uh, we'll see. Good night. Would the doctor care for a brandy before retiring? Um, no, thank you. Some warm milk, perhaps? No, thank you very much. No, thanks. Ovaltine? Nothing. Thank you. I'm a little tired. Then I will say good night. Good night. Good night. Freddy begins unpacking as the Fräulein walks toward the door, but stops at the painting of his grandfather. Good night, darling. In an oh-so-subtle display, she kisses the painting. Good night, Herr Doctor. Good night, Frau Blue. Blue Heart. <laughs> Finally, she exits. That night, Freddy stirs in his sleep. Oh. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not a Frankenstein. I'm not a Frankenstein. I'm a Frankenstein. Don't give me that. I don't believe in fate. And I won't say it. All right, you win. You win. I give. I'll say it. I'll say it. I'll say it. Destiny! Destiny, no escaping that for me. Destiny! Destiny, no escaping that for me. <laughs> Destiny, no, no escape. Dr. Frankenstein, wake up! Freddy wakes and sees Inga at his bedside. What is it? You were having a nightmare. Freddy sits up as he hears the faint sound of a violin. What's that strange music? I have no idea, but it seems to be coming from behind the bookcase. Behind the bookcase? Hand me that rope, would you, dear? She does so, and Freddy moves to the other side of the room. You were right. It's coming from behind this wall. Where is it? What? Where is it? There's a, always a device. I could just spot the triggering mechanism. Hello? Among the many books with dark covers, he spots a stark white one. He plucks it off the shelf, but nothing happens. He puts it back and then steps down the row of bookcases. It seems louder. Hand me that candle. Inga takes a candle from a wall sconce, but as she goes to head hand it to Freddy, he spun along with the bookcase into a hidden passage, leaving behind a blank wall. Keep the candle back! She does, and the bookcase does a full rotation, meaning Freddy is still not in the bedroom. All right, I think I figured it out. Take out the candle. I'll block the bookcase with my body. She does so, and... Uh, now listen to me very carefully. Don't put the candle back. With all of your might, shove against the other side of the bookcase. Is that perfectly clear? I think so. 
She runs into the bookcase, forcing it to rotate to its original position. Uh, good girl. Good girl indeed, but now Inga is trapped on the other side. But Scandal back. He does. And for no discernible or logical reason, the bookcase does a quarter rotation, leaving it halfway between the two rooms. The passageway is now accessible. Oh, look! Doctor! A passageway! Whatever that music is, it's coming from down there. I better take a look. Let me come with you, Doctor. Please, I, I don't want to stay up here alone. All right, then. Close your robe and follow me. He reaches for the candle. Oh, Doctor! Good thinking. Let's try this one. He goes to the other side of the bookcase, and Inga moves with him. Stand back. He pulls the candle off of its sconce. And nothing happens. They walk into the passageway, the violin music getting louder as they descend a cobweb-covered staircase. Inga startles as thunder claps and a rat skitters past them. Don't be afraid, my dear. It's just a rat. Filthy, slimy rat. As they pass one section of wall, an ancient sign can just barely be made out in the afterglow of their light. It reads, Capacity. Not more than three persons by order of Fire Department. Finally, they reach a landing. A door separates them from whatever lies beyond. Freddy takes hold of the handle. The handle crumbles in his hand. He gently pushes against the door. It creaks open and the violin music stops. They enter the laboratory and a row of heads displayed on a shelf. The first is a skull with a sign that says three years dead in front of it. Good Lord. To its left is a skull with tattered skin clinging to it, and a sign that says, Two years dead. Then one with most of its skin and an eyeball that is, Six months dead. And then he comes face to face with one labeled freshly dead. The head is completely intact, both eyes wide open. The face is smiling. It is, in fact, Igor, who is standing behind the shelf, still very much alive. I ain't got nobody, and nobody cares for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Igor. Frederick. How did you get here? Through the dumbwaiter. I heard the strangest music from the upstairs kitchen, and I just followed it down. Call it a hunch. There must have been someone else down here then. It would seem that way. There's the only other door. Wait, Master. It might be dangerous. You go first. They go through the door. It's pitch black, except for the single candle that Freddy holds. Aren't there any lights in this place? Two nasty-looking switches over here, but I'm not going to be the first. Freddy walks over and throws the first switch. Sparks fly from it, and he quickly flips it down again. Damn your eyes! Too late. He flips the second switch, and the lights turn on. The lab can be seen in all of its old splendor, but covered in dust and spider webs. Ooh! So this is where it all happened. Freddy looks upon the machinery, knowing what happened in this very room years ago. Just think, a dead brain 
ready to live again in a new body. Look, no blood, no decomposition, just a few sutures. Throw the main switch. Yes, master. What a filthy mess. I don't know, a little paint, a few flowers, a couple of throw pillows. Well, it seems our mysterious violins has disap... Disappeared. Appeared. Shh! Light coming from behind that doorway. Follow me. They quietly cross the laboratory to the door and burst into the next room, but find nobody there. By the light of Freddy's candle, they see a small, creepy room filled with musty books. There is a table in the center of the room with a large book, an ashtray with a smoldering cigar, and a violin on it. Doctor, look! This explains the music. Oh, it's still warm. But who was playing it? I don't know. Whatever this... Whoever it is, just barely finished putting out his cigar. Such strange goings on. What is this place? Music room? But there's nothing but books and papers. Books and paper. It is! This is my grandfather's private li library. I feel it. Look. Look at this. He sees the cover of the large book on the table. How I Did It by Victor Frankenstein. He opens the book. And several hours later, Inga and Igor are on the verge of falling asleep. But Freddy is still engrossed in the book. Till from the midst of this darkness, a sudden light broke in upon me. A light so brilliant and wondrous, and yet so simple. Change the poles from plus to minus, and from minus to plus. I alone succeeded in discovering that the cause of the generation of life, nay, even more, I myself became capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. It could work! Upstairs, the painting of Victor Frankenstein now has a manic grin, a dark pride in his descendant. The next morning, Freddy and Inga eat breakfast together while Igor draws on a large pad of paper. Kipper? Thank you, Doctor. After taking another bite of food, Freddy wipes his lips with a napkin and resumes reading the book. As the minuteness of the part formed a great hindrance to my I resolved, therefore, to make a creature of gigantic stature. Of course, that would simplify everything. In other words, his veins, his feet, the hands, his organs would all have to be increased in size. Exactly. You would have an enormous schwanz, Tucker. Freddy's eyes widen at the realization. That, I suppose, goes without saying. Oof. He's going to be very popular. So then. What we're aiming for is a being about seven feet in height, with all features congenitally or artificially proportioned in size. Something like this? Igor turns the pad of paper toward the others. He has drawn a simple but impressive sketch of the creature to be. Hello. Caught something. Crude, yes. Primitive, yes. Perhaps even grotesque, yet something inexplicable to me. This might be our man. In the nearby village, a large man is hung in the town square. And that evening, the body is buried in a cemetery by several workers. The gravekeeper looks disdainfully at the fresh grave as the workers heap dirt upon it. 
All right, all right. That's good enough for the likes of him. Across is hammered into the ground with the head of a shovel as Freddy and Igor watch from outside the cemetery's gate. Freddy crouches while Igor stands at his full, hunched height. Get down! The workers finish bashing the cross into place before walking off. Now! Igor opens the gate, and the two unearth the wooden coffin. What a filthy job. Could be worse. How? Could be raining. A crack of thunder is heard, and rain starts pouring upon them. They load the coffin onto a cart and wheel it through the town's cobblestone streets. The wheel of the cart catches on a misaligned stone, and the coffin falls off. Several of its boards break as it hits the ground, and the corpse's arm hangs out from the side of the box. Freddy and Igor start to lift it, but hear footsteps nearby. Quick! A constable rounds a nearby corner and sees them. The coffin is on the cart again and covered with a blanket, but the arm is still sticking out. Freddy has positioned it under his own arm, which he has obscured with his cloak. Oh yeah, do you need a hand? Ah, no thanks. Uh, have one. Thanks very much all the same. Well, well, just a moment, sir. I know everyone in this neighborhood, but I've never seen your face before. Can't you account for yourself? Yes, uh, I'm Dr. Frederick Frankenstein, newly arrived from America. Oh, yes, sir, America. I first told you here. I'm Constable Henry. Sir, pleased to meet you. The constable offers Freddy a handshake, which he has to accept with the corpse's hand. How very nice to meet you, constable. For your chill to the bone, sir. A knife's warm fire will be the thing for you. Yes, yes. And a nip from the old bottle wouldn't be too bad either, would it? That's the ticket, yes. Well, if you have everything in hand, sir, I'll say good night. Thank you very much, Constable. Yeah, at yeah, your service, sir, always. The Constable salutes, and Freddy raises the limp hand to his forehead in response. Good night, Constable. Ach, good night, then. Once Constable Henry is out of sight, Freddy shoves the loose arm into the coffin again and returns to the castle, where they put their newly acquired resource on the laboratory's operating table. Oh, what an awesome sight. What a profound and reverent night is this. Such a specimen for a body. All we need now is an equally magnificent brain. You know what to do, Ian. I have a pretty good idea. Good man. Freddy reflexively puts his hand on Igor's left shoulder again, but realizes that something is different from the last time he did so. His right shoulder is larger than his left. Didn't you... You used to have that on the other side. What? You're a... Never mind. You have the name I gave I have it written down. He holds out his hand, the name written on his palm in pen. H. Delbrook. Hans Delbrook. Later, Igor arrives at a hospital door with the words... Brain Depository. After 5 p.m., slip brains through slot in door. Printed on it. He reaches his arm through the slot in the door and turns the handle from the inside, allowing himself into the depository. He pokes his head inside and is startled when he sees a hand right in front of his face. 
is less surprised when he realizes it's his own hand still going through the door. He skulks into the room and quickly finds a row of jars with brains in them. One of the jars is on a stand labeled Hans Delbruck, Scientist and Saint. He takes the jar and turns to leave when a crash of thunder is heard, just as he sees his reflection in an inconveniently placed full-length mirror. He drops the jar in fright and looks down at the splattered brain and glass. He returns to the row of jars and grabs the one that was beside Delbrook's. The label on this jar stand says, Do not use this brain. Abnormal! He then returns to the lab. Soon enough, the creature is now fully assembled. A hulking figure to rival Victor's original creation, held down on an operating table by metal restraints. Freddy looks over his creation with Inga. And then she speaks. He's hideous. He's beautiful. And he is mine. Quickly now. We're fighting time and the elements. He looks up a shaft that runs from the ceiling of the lab up to the roof, where Igor is flying two kites while wearing rubber boots, rubber gloves, and a rubber whaler's coat and hat. Thunder continues to rumble in the sky. Are you ready? Are you sure this is how they did it? Yes, yes, it's all written down in the notes. Now tie off the kites and hurry down as fast as you can. What's the hurry? There's a, possible, there's a possibility of electrocution. Do you understand? There is no response. He sees Igor looking down at him. I say there's a possibility of electrocution. Do you understand? Freddy hears footsteps beside him. I understand, I understand. Why are you shouting? He looks upward. Nobody is standing on the roof. Did you tie up the kites? Of course. All right, good. Um, check the generator. Yes, master. He starts fiddling with the massive generator. Igor, release the safety valve on the main wheel. Yes, master. Oh, Inga, can you, uh, imagine? Oh, Inga, can you imagine the brain of Hans Delbruck in this body? Oh, Frederick. This is the moment. Well, dear, are you ready? Yes, Doctor. Elevate me. Now? Right here? Yes. Yes. Rise the platform. Oh, the platform. Oh, that. Yeah, yes. She moves to a wheel on the wall that is several feet in diameter, the, with Igor standing on the other side. From that fateful day when stinking bits of slime first crawled from the sea and shouted to the cold stars, I am man! Our greatest dread has always been the knowledge of our own mortality. But tonight... We hurl the gauntlet of science into the frightful face of death itself. Inga and Igor start turning the wheel, and the small platform holding Freddy and the table with the creature begins lifting upward into the shaft and to the roof. Tonight, we shall ascend into the heavens. We shall mock the earthquake. We shall command the thunders and penetrate into the very womb of impervious nature herself. The platform reaches the womb, uh, roof, and the table with the creature's inert body is directly under an electrode. When I give the word, throw the first switch. You've got it, master. Get ready, get set, go! 
Igor throws the first switch, and small jolts of electricity are emitted from the electrode into the creature's body. Throw the second switch! The electricity intensifies! Throw the third switch! Not the third switch! Throw it! I say throw it! He throws the third switch, and the generator starts exploding. Life! Life, do you hear me? Give my creation life! Lightning strikes, and the creature's body begins to glow. Freddy holds a stethoscope to the creature for a moment. He frowns with uncertainty. The noise around him is too much. Turn everything off and bring me down. Igor pulls the switch, and the machinery goes silent. The only sound is the clicking of chains as the platform is lowered back into the laboratory. Freddy puts his ear to the creature's chest, then starts hitting it. He repeats his literally violent attempt at chest compressions and listens for a pulse. But the massive cadaver remains still. Nothing. Oh, Doctor, I'm sorry. No? No, be of good cheer. If science teaches us anything, it teaches us to accept our failures as well as our successes. With quite dignity and grace. Son of a bitch bastard, I'll get you for this! He attempts to strangle the creature, but his hands barely fit around half of its neck. What did you do to me? What did you do to me? Doctor, stop it! You'll kill him! Freddy rapidly punches the creature in the chest and starts flailing about. I don't want to live! I do not want to live! Quiet dignity and grace. Oh, Mama. Igor and Inga put Freddy's arms over their shoulders and carry him out of the lab. Back in the village, a group of citizens attend a town hall meeting. Two elderly men sit at a table in front of the other villagers. One of the... One of the villagers is Constable Henry. I apologize. The script is difficult to read. One of them by Constable Henry and the village burgomaster. Oh, Tosh. This man's different, I tell you. You can say that after you've talked to him for five minutes. A man in a fancy coat raises his hand, and the man next to the constable calls on him. Yes. He's a Frankenstein, and they're all alike. Yeah, yeah, that's you. Rubble. They can't help it. All those scientists, they're all alike. They say they're working for us. But what they really want is to rule the world like billionaires. Yeah! The Burgermeister hits the table with a gavel. Ah, that's enough now. I will not have this meeting become a free-for-all. These are very serious charges you're making, and all the more painful to us, your elders, because we still have nightmares from five times before. Now, we haven't even heard from the one man most qualified to judge the situation fairly. Inspector Kemp, will you talk to us, please? On the far side of the room, a stoic constable with both an eye patch and monocle on his left eye stands with a cigar held between two of the rigid, splayed fingers of his right hand. He puts his left hand to his right hand and twists it. The sound of metal clicking 
is heard as his hand rotates on his wrist, positioning the cigar upward. He puts the cigar in his mouth with his left hand, then uses the hand to reverse the position of his right hand. Close the hand's last three fingers, then pushes down his forearm before leaning down to a hearth, lighting his pointer finger on fire and using it to light the cigar. He then slaps his elbow, rotating his entire arm, and then shoves his flaming finger into a beer stein, extinguishing it. Every moment of this is clearly a prosthetic right arm punctuated with mechanical clicking... Has everybody gotten that? He walks forward and addresses the crowd. Gentlemen, a riot is an ugly thing. And once you get one started, there is little chance of stopping it short of bloodshed. I think before we go around killing people, we had better make damn sure of our evidence. His monocle falls off. He cleans it off and places it over his eye patch once again. We had better confirm the fact that young Frankenstein is indeed following in his grandfather's footsteps, yeah? What? 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 Huh? Following in his grandfather's footsteps. Footsteps. He stomps in place. Oh, footsteps. footsteps. Okay. I, Step of the foot. I think what is in order is for me to pay a little visit on the good hair doctor. Would we'll help to have a nice, quiet chat. Back at the castle, Freddy, Inga, and Igor sit at a long dining room table set with food and wine. Freddy stares into space listlessly. Reputation. Reputation! Oh, Doctor, you mustn't do this to yourself. Got to stop thinking about it. Why, look, you haven't even touched your food. Freddy smashes his palms into his dinner like a messy little baby. There! Now I've touched it. Happy? You know, I'll never forget my old dad. When these things would happen to him, the things he'd say to me. What did he say? What the hell are you doing in the bathroom all day and night? Why don't you get out of there and give someone else a chance? Igor nods reassuringly and takes another bite of his food. Oh, maybe it's better this way, poor lifeless Hulk. Maybe it's better off dead. What is this? What's Walder Kerstot? Mm. Oh, do you like it? I'm not partial to desserts myself, but this is excellent. Uh, who are you talking to? You. You just made a yummy sound. So I thought you'd like the dessert. I didn't make a yummy sound. I just asked you what it was. But you did. I just heard it. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. <clears throat> well, now look here. If it wasn't you and it wasn't you... They all drop their silverware and run down to the laboratory where they find the creature, eyes open... And looking at them. Alive! It's alive! It's alive! Stand back! He approaches the table and looks sweetly at the creature. Hello there. I'm going to set you free. Mm. Inga, is the sedative ready? Yes, Doctor. Freddy carefully removes the metal restraints. The creature remains still. I want you to sit up. The creature lifts its back off the table, its arms still held out. It then shifts one leg at a time as it turns toward Freddy. 
stand on your feet. Mm. Can do it. The creature hops off the table and looks like it's about to fall. But Freddy catches it, and it is able to stand up straight. Now? Walk. The creature lurches forward, arms still extended. Freddy has to hold it by the arms to keep it from falling forward, but it is able to take small, abrupt steps. Oh, Doctor, I'm frightened! Don't worry. He slowly lets go of the creature, and it doesn't fall as it continues forward, taking increasingly natural, if lumbering, steps. Good! Good! Igor, clearly nervous, pulls out a cigarette and goes to light it. But as he ignites a match, the creature starts flailing wildly and grabs Freddy. What is it? What's the matter? The creature starts to choke Freddy. Quick! Give him... Quick! Give him... What? Uh, g give him the what? Freddy, no longer able to form words, taps three fingers against his arm and makes other gestures. Uh, three, three syllables. Uh, the first syllable sounds like... Freddy taps his skull. Head! Sounds like head. Freddy points at Inga as he continues to be choked out. Dead. Said. There is confirmation. Said. 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 Second syllable. Little word. This. That. The. Ah. Uh, ah. Yes. Ah. Said. Ah. Said. Uh, said a dirty word. He said a dirty word. No, that's that's not it. Third syllable sounds like give. Give. Said a give. Give him a said a give. Oh, tiv. Tiv. Said a tiv. On the nosy. Inga goes around the creature and pokes it in the butt with the syringe. <coughs> the creature quickly passes out, and Freddy lays him on a table as he catches his breath. Set a give? He slumps into a chair, and Inga gets uncomfortably close to him. Oh, Frederick, are you all right? Yes. Would you excuse me for one minute, dear? Of course, Doctor. She steps away. Igor? May I speak with you for a moment? Uh, of course. Sit down, won't you? Oh, uh, thank you. No, no, uh, up here. About right. Igor sits on the table beside the unconscious creature. Oh, uh, thank you. Now, that brain that you gave me, was it Hans Delbrooks? Um, no. Ah, good, uh. Would you mind telling me whose brain I did put in? And you won't be angry. I will not. Abby someone. Abby someone. Abby who? Abby uh, normal. Abby normal. I'm almost sure that was the name. Are you saying that I put an abnormal brain into a seven and a half foot long, 54 inch wide? He chokes Igor and starts lifting him up and down. Gorilla? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, uh, qu quick, quick, give me, give him the... What? Three syllables? Yes. A booming knock is heard at the door. I wonder who that could be at this hour. Inga, quick, see who that is. She runs off. Igor, you put that... 
Sting back on the operating table and strap him down tightly. He starts walking out of the lab. Uh, uh, where are you going? To wash up. I've got to look normal. We've all of us got to behave normally. The bow tie on his tuxedo comes undone, and the collar flies open. He composes himself, but on a, puts on a lounge robe, and a few moments later is speaking with Inspector Kemp while playing a game of darts. Ha! Ah, monsters! He throws his darts, hitting a bullseye on the first one, and respectable scores with the rest. Ah, excellent shot. This is the 20th century, Kemp. Monsters are passe, like ghosts and goblins. Not to the good people of this village here, Doctor. To them, he is a very real thing. He collects the darts from the board and stabs them all into his prosthetic arm. Especially when there's a Frankenstein residing in this house. Seeing that Freddy has his back turned, Kemp quickly sticks all five of the darts in the bullseye and runs back to the shot line. Freddy turns just as the inspector finishes his shots. Nice grouping. Thank you. I wouldn't think an intelligent fellow like you would fall for all this superstitious work. It is not superstition that worries me, Herr Doctor, but genes and... He waits until Freddy is about to take his shot. Chromosomes. Kemp's abrupt interjection causes Freddy to miss the dartboard entirely. Rubbish. That you might say, but this is Transylvania. Timing his words to Freddy's second throw, the doctor accidentally tosses the dart through a window. And you are a Frankenstein. Another dart out the window. You seem unusually upset by this discussion. Not in the least. His next start hits a cat that we've never seen, nor ever will see. I find it extremely amusing, that's all. His last dart flies out of his hand on the backswing, and the sound of something shattering is heard. Well, this was fun. Now, if you don't mind, Inspector, I'm a little bit tired. Then, I may give the villagers your complete assurance that you have no interest whatsoever in carrying out your grandfather's work. Mm. Kemp and Freddy look at each other, the doctor's eyes wide. May I take that for a yes? Mm. Very well. I trust you can find the way out yourself. Oh, of course. Until we meet again, Herr Baron. <laughs> he swings his right shoulder forward, the momentum bringing his prosthetic hand into a salute. Yes, drop by any time. We're always open. The inspector puts his left hand to his right and tries to push it down, but the prosthetic is stuck in place. He awkwardly shuffles off, saluting the whole time as he exits the castle and gets into his car, which pulls away unusually slowly. Unbeknownst to Freddy and Camp, the inspector's tires are now all flat, punctured by arrows. Meanwhile, the housekeeper enters the laboratory and finds the re-restrained creature. 
the housekeeper begins to speak. Oh, Victor, Victor, we done, we've done it. I'm going to set you free. Would you like that, mein Soitskopf? Mm. She starts emotionally undoing the restraints. They wanted to hurt you, but I'm going to help you. Thank heavens that is over. Freddy, Inga, and Igor enter and see what's happening. Frau Blur! Stop! Don't come closer! What are you doing? I'm going to set him free! No! No, you mustn't! Yes! Are you insane? He'll kill you! No, he won't. Not this one. He is as gentle as a lamb. The creature flails abound and stands up. Stand back. Stand back. For the love of God, he has a rotten brain. It's not rotten. It's a good brain. It's rotten. I tell you, rotten. Ah, uh, Ixnay on the Otten, right? I'm not afraid. I know what he likes. She pulls out a violin and starts playing. As soon as the creature hears the soft music, it immediately calms down and starts playfully reaching for a lucerner and starts playfully reaching for illusionary butterflies in the air. That music. Yes, it's in your blood. It's in the blood of all Frankensteins. Frankensteins. Whatever, Frankenbeans. It reaches the soul when the words are useless. Your grandfather used to play it to the creature he was making. Then it was you all the time? Yes. You played the music in the middle of the night? That was you, right? Yes! To get us into the laboratory? Yes! That was your cigar and smoldering in the ashtray? Yes! And it was you who left my grandfather's book out for me to find. Yes! So that I would? Yes! Then you and Victor were? Yes! Yes! Say it! He was my boy! Suddenly, the generator starts sparking, and the creature's calm demeanor is broken. It starts running up the stairs and out of the laboratory. You will never catch him now. He's free. Do you hear? Free! The creature breaks out of the castle. A thunderstorm rages outside, and a crash of thunder only serves to further agitate the creature as it shambles off into the night. A few seconds later, Freddy and the others reach the door and see it broken off of its hinges. Gone! Gone! We've got to find him, do you understand? We've got to find him before he kills someone. What have I done? Oh, God in heaven, what have I done? We will now take a ten-minute intermission. Don't be afraid. We will be right back. Welcome back, boys and ghouls. Now, as they say, look alive 
and we shall continue our radio drama presentation of Young Frankenstein. The next morning, a child in the village sings as they pluck petals off a flower, tossing the petals into a well. Oh, I love my pretty little flower. Oh, I love my pretty little flower. Oh, I love my pretty little flower. The creature stalks up behind the child. <clears throat> Later, another villager nails boards over their windows. That monster is loose. Boards must be tight. There. He turns to his wife, who is sharpening a meat cleaver. Thank God you put Helga to bed. With all this monster business, I take no chances. I remember the last time. But, Papa, I thought you... I told you that I was turning the rust brand. Don't you remember? I asked you to put Helga to... You... Outside, the creature stands beside Helga, now delicately holding the flower, plucking off the last petal. Now throw a kiss and say bye-bye. Mm. Mm. He kisses his hand and throws the kiss into the well, followed by the flower stem. Oh dear, nothing left. What shall we throw in now? Oh dear. Inside, Helga's parents continue talking. Uh, maybe she was in the bathroom when you looked. But I didn't even look upstairs. I thought you did. You didn't look upstairs? They both sprint up, the sec up to the second floor of the house while Helga invites the creature to join her on a seesaw. Okay, now sit down. The creature smacks the vacant end of the seesaw. No, sit. No, sit. Oh, good. The creature sits down on the opposite end of the seesaw, catapulting Helga into the air and through her bedroom window. She lands in her bed, the impact knocking her unconscious just before her parents walk in, relieved to see their daughter. I'm certain she's just fine. Elsewhere in the village, an elderly man prays alone. A visitor is all I ask. A temporary companion to help me pass a few short hours in my lonely life by lifting. We are need to get so swole. The creature bursts into the house. Ah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. The Lord, our God of gains. The man puts his hand on the walls around him and feels his way across the room. He is clearly blind. He reaches the creature and touches his arm. Mm. Oh, no, no, no. Don't speak or don't say a word. We are expressing ourselves with our bodies today. Oh, my joy and my prize from heaven. Oh. You are so tall, so big and strong, but there's always room to get stronger. You must have been the tallest one in your PE class. Did you have the good gym teacher? Well, today, your gym teacher's name is Harold. I live here all alone with my biceps and my triceps and my quads. What is your name? Mmm. I didn't get that. I'm sorry. Mmm. Mm. Oh, forgive me. I didn't realize you were a mute. Well, we support all disabilities here, as you can see, clearly see. How heaven plans. Me, a poor old blind man, and you, a mute, united by the joy of CrossFit. Pardon me a moment. Your narrator needs a drink. 
He tries to pat the creature on his shoulder, but misjudges and taps his chest. Oh, an incredibly big mute. But your hand is frozen, my child. Before we get to our lifting and struggling, how does a nice bowl of soup sound? Mmm. Harold leads the creature inside. Hold out your bow, then. Oh, my friend, my friend, you do not know what your visit means to me. How long I've waited for the pleasure of another human being and your large muscles and your time so that we can spend doing some stretches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in our preoccupation with worldly matters, with our, oh, shiny muscle, oiled muscles, oh, yeah, we tend to forget the simple pleasures that are the basis for true happiness, like yoga. That's right, time to get in touch with your interior. The creature recovers and continues holding his bowl out as Harold brings forth another ladle full of soup and misses again. That's right, you have to get protein in you. I made this special vegetable borscht to fill you with energy. And now, how about a little wine with your soup? Yeah. Mm. The creature holds up a ceramic mug, and fortunately this time, Harold thinks to reach out and hold the creature's hand, giving him the context for where to pour the wine. It's very good, yeah? Mm -hmm. The creature goes to take a sip. Oh, wait. The creature sneaks a sip. A toast, a toast to long friendship, long legs full of muscles, and long other things as well. Harold holds up his own metal mug and slams it into the creatures, shattering it. Oh, how hungry you must have been. After all, after a good workout session, we know we need to refuel, living the healthy lifestyle, having the lots of carbs. But. Every day can be a cheat day if we play it right. For a special occasion, I've been saving cigars. He smiles as he holds up two cigars. Here you go, darling. The creature takes one, but it, star but it startles as Harold picks up the lit candle at the center of the table and holds it near the creature. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, fire is very good. Fire mm. is the inner fire that fuels us. Mm. It is the second most important emoji after 100. Mm. Fire is good. Fire is our friend. Yes, here we go. He lights his own cigar. Do you see? Do you have your cigar? Let me see. Let me see. All right. Now, now, now. Just hold it right there. Now, don't inhale until the tip glows. The creature holds out the cigar, but Harold foolishly lights the creature's finger on fire. Ow! The creature runs through the front door of the house without bothering to open it. Oh no! Wait, wait, where are you going? Oh, my lieber, I was going to mix the espresso. Right. The creature continues making his way through the village, eventually coming upon a man playing violin. The creature approaches him, enraptured, and the violinist slowly backs away while continuing to play with an even expression, guiding the creature into an alley. Now! 
a rope net is dropped onto the creature and struggles against the now revealed Freddy and Igor while Inga sticks him with a sedative. He collapses a few moments later, falling on Igor. He's out! Oh no! They return to the castle and lock the creature in the dungeon. Freddy stands outside the dungeon door with Inga, Igor, and Frau Blucher <laughs> nearby. I'm going in there. Bring me that candle. No! No! Yes. Igor hands Freddy a candle. Love is the only thing that can save this poor creature. And I'm going to convince him he is love, even at the cost of my own life. No matter what you hear, no matter how cruelly I beg, no matter how terribly I may scream, not open this door. I will undo everything I've worked for. You understand? Not open this door. Yes, Doctor. Nice working with you. Freddy enters the dungeon, and the creature wakes up. Ah! The creature sits up, and Freddy... F the creature sits up, and Freddy briskly walks to the door. Let me out. Let me out of here. Get me the hell out of here. What's the matter with you people? I was joking. Don't you know a joke when you hear one? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Get me out of here. Open the goddamn door or I'll kick your rotten heads in. Mommy? Inga goes to open the door, but is stopped by the housekeeper. With the housekeeper's protest, the creature realizes... <laughs> Nobody... All right. The creature realizes it's in chains and stares at Freddy, who musters up his courage and faces the Goliath. Hello, handsome. The creature looks around in confusion. You're a good-looking fellow, do you know that? People laugh at you. People hate you, but why do they hate you? Because they are jealous. Look at that boyish face. Look at that sweet smile. Do you want to talk about physical strength? Do you want to talk about sheer muscle? Do you want to talk about the Olympian ideal? You're a god. And listen to me. You are not evil. You are good. <laughs> This is a nice boy. This is a good boy. This is a mother's angel. And I want the world to know, once and for all, and without any shame, that we love him. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you how to walk, how to speak, how to move, how to think. Together, you and I are going to make the greatest single contribution Science since the creation of fire. Dr. Frankenstein, are you all right? My name is Frankenstein. Some time later, an event is held at the Bucharest Academy of Science. The sign outside the auditorium says, Tonight only. Dr. F. Frankenstein presents the creature in a startling new experiment in reanimation. Presented in cooperation with TNS, Transylvania Neurological Society, and Taco Bell. Sold out. The seats of the Grand Theater are filled with distinguished patrons and academics alike. 
an MC steps in front of the closed stage curtain. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, tonight it is my great privilege of introducing to you a man whose family name was once both famous and infamous. And now, may I present to you, Dr. Baron Frederick von Frankenstein. Freddy walks on stage in a tuxedo. My fellow sign. Yes, and neurosurgeons, ladies and gentlemen, a few short weeks ago, coming from a background, believe me, as conservative and traditionally grounded in scientific fact as any of you, I began an experiment in, in incredulous as it may sound, the reanimation of dead tissue. Several people in the Discord chat begin to laugh. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> the people in the audience laugh as well. It's not clear why they would be mocking him when the advertising for the presentation clearly stated that what was being shown and what they clearly paid to attend. What I have to offer you might possibly be the gateway to immortality. Ladies and gentlemen, May I present for your intellectual and philosophical pleasure, the creature. The curtain parts, revealing the creature in a medical gown, and the audience erupts into a panic. At this point, it seems likely that there was some production or script oversight in having the shot of the sign outside the theater, because the attendees seem to be entirely surprised by what they're seeing. I mean, did anybody, like, did any, was there anybody in the editing room? It's fine. Please, remain in your seats, I beg you. We are not children here, we are scientists. I assure you, there is nothing to fear. First... May I offer for your consideration a neurological demonstration of the primary cerebular functions, balance and coordination. He turns to the creature. Walk heel to toe. The creature does so with practiced ease, and the crowd applauds. Backwards. The creature takes a few steps back, and there is more applause. He lives for the applause, applause, applause. Freddy pops a candy in the creature's mouth. Inga is backstage in a fine fur coat, clapping excitedly. Ladies and gentlemen, up until now you've seen the creature perform the simple mechanics of motor activity. But for what you're about to see next, we must enter quite into the realm of genius. Ladies and gentlemen, madames and messieurs, Damon and Harum, from what was once an inarticulate mess of lifeless tissue, may I now present a cultured, sophisticated, Man about town. The stage lights go down. Hit it! The lights turn on again, and now the creature, in a miraculous quick change, is also in a tuxedo and top hat, holding a formal cane as it smiles and poses with Freddy. Music starts playing and they begin tap dancing together, a five, six, seven, eight. If you are blue and you don't know where to go to, why don't you go where fashion sits? <laughs> Differently types who wear a day coat, pants and stri with stripes and cutaway coat, perfect fits. <laughs> Dressed up like a million dollar trooper. Trying mighty hard to look like Gary Cooper. Uber duper. Come, let's mix where Rockefellers walk with sticks and umbrellas in their mitts. Bang on the reeds. 
delightful. They break into a tap dancing interlude, and the creature displays impressive dexterity, which has the whole crowd applauding. But as they reach the finale, one of the stage lights bursts and creates a small fire. <coughs> Freddy quickly stomps out the small flame and watches as the creature fails its dexterity check. It's nothing. Nothing, I tell you. Five, six, seven, eight. He resumes his dancing, but the creature is still stunned. For God's sake, come on! Are you trying to make me look like a fool? The crowd, apparently with zero patience for even the slightest gaff at this performance that was advertised as a scientific presentation and our world-class dance performance, begins throwing vegetables on the stage. I just... <sighs> Freddy quickly intervenes. Please, I beg you, for safety's sakes, don't humiliate him! <laughs> the agitated creature attempts to run into the crowd, but Freddy grabs it by the arm. Come back! Do you understand me? I will not let you destroy my work! As your creator, I command you to come back! The crowd, which continues to act less logical than the creature, continues to throw large vegetables at the creature. I don't even understand where they got these. After being hit in the face by a bunch of carrots, the creature tosses Freddy aside, and the crowd still doesn't stop harassing the creature until it jumps off the stage and starts strangling a man, at which point everyone starts screaming and running. Police quickly grab the creature and haul him away. Soon he's in prison, bound in chains with a conveniently placed window for people to yell at him. Freddy and Inga watch. Chained. Chained like a beast in a cage. Oh, Doctor, I feel so terrible. There's only one answer. If I could find a way to equalize the imbalance in... His cerebral spinal fluid. He'd be right as rain. But how? How before it's too late? Oh, Frederick. She kisses his hand. If only there was some way I could. She kisses his hand several more times. Relieve this torture you're going through. She kisses his hand slower. There was some way I could help, too. More kisses, specifically just on his hand. Relieve the tension. There was just some way I could give you a little peace. She holds his hand to her chest. A few minutes later, Frau Blucher <laughs> walks into the lab. Doctor, I have... She looks around, and she doesn't see anyone. Doctor? She turns to leave when she hears a voice from afar. What is it? Doctor, where are you? The operating table that once held the creature starts descending from the roof, now made up as a bed, with both Freddy and Inga in it, their bare shoulders visible while the rest of them are, is under the covers. I'm sorry, Doctor. This cable came while you are gone. I thought I told you never to interrupt me while I'm working. I'm sorry, Doctor. I thought this was an emergency. You see, your fiancé will be arriving any second. What? Elizabeth? Here tonight? Yes, I will go prepare her a room at once. I suggest you put on a tie. A few moments later, Freddy is in his formal lounge robe with a bow tie. Inga is in a stunning sequined dress. And Igor is in his usual black robes. The three of them waiting at the front steps of the castle as a taxi pulls up and Elizabeth walks out 
wearing a stately dress with a boa and turban. Darling! Darling! Surprised? Surprise! Love me? Love you? Well, let's turn in. Darling! It's been a long day, and I'm sure you're very tired. I'll just pay the driver. As he moves to the front of the cab, Igor approaches Elizabeth. Darling! What? Surprised? I... yes? Love me? Well... Well, let's turn in. Ah! Uh... Darling! Yes! Say nothing. Act casual. Gross. Freddy turns to her again. Igor looks innocent. Freddy? Yes, I... I think... Yes, I am a bit tired, after all. I'd like you to meet my assistants, Inga and Igor. She smiles at Inga. How do you do? She turns to Igor. And then she turns to Inga again. Anyway, how do you do? This is my financier, Elizabeth. I'm so happy to meet you at last. Fiance. Why not Excuse me. Excuse me, darling. What exactly is it that you do? Do? Well, I assist Dr. Frank Frankenstein in the laboratory. We have intellectual discussions and we... As a matter of fact, we're stabbing one of you are driving up. Freddy steps in and prevents Inga from saying anything further. Igor, would you give me a hand with the bags? Certainly. You take the blonde, I'll take the one in the turban. Arr. Gross. Igor aggressively bites at Elizabeth's boa and is rightfully uh. hit in the head with her purse. Stop that! I'm talking about the luggage. Yes, master. Ladies, this way. It's going to be a long night. If you need any help with the girls, please don't... Get in there! Gross. Meanwhile, in the prison, the creature yells at a guard who smugly regards his captive. Alright, you settle down now, cause we're gonna be pals, right? Mm. Nice and cozy, just low like friends. He pulls out a cigarette and lights a match causing the creature to recoil in fear. Oi, 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 what's the matter now? Are you afraid of this little fire? See this can hurt you, see? He holds the match an inch away from the creature's face. <sighs> he puts out the match. Eh, uh, some monster you are. See, Ma was right. Little boys ain't supposed to play with fire. He lights another match. <laughs> Is they? Cause they might get. He holds the match to the creature's face again, but this time gets too close and is strangled until he is unconscious. The creature then rips off his shackles and escapes the prison. In the town square, an angry mob is forming in front of the town hall. Inspector Kemp emerges from the building with another officer beside him. Inspector Kemp halts the crowd. Halt! He raises his good arm and turns to the other man. Up! The officer raises Kemp's prosthetic arm for him. A riot is an ugly thing. He lowers his good arm and uses his shoulder to create downward momentum for the prosthetic. And I think that it is just about time that we had one. Ah. 
Yeah. yeah. I like yeah. it, Riot. Yeah. Riot. Yeah. yeah, let's do one of those. Yeah. As heaven that, they're is a good my video game company. Beast. Down with As... the corporations. Yeah. Ravens, Ravens, Ravens. Oh, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Inspector. <clears throat> As heaven is my witness, up. His arm is lifted again. He will curse the day that he was born a Frankenstein. What? What? Huh? 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 I said he will curse. I said he will curse the day he was born as a Frankenstein. Oh, yeah! Yeah! Yeah, let's get him! The riot begins. Meanwhile, Freddy sits on the floor of his bedroom while Elizabeth sits in a large chair filing her nails. Loose! He's broken loose! Do you know what this means? Darling, you mustn't worry so. I suppose you're right. Of course I am. Now come along like a good boy. What would I do without you? Is your room just the hall in case I get the frights during the night? Well, yes, but I thought perhaps tonight, under the circumstances, I might stay here with you. Would you want me like this now? So soon before our wedding? So near we can almost touch it. Yes! Whoa, whoa, boy! Or... Or to wait just a little longer... When I can give you myself, when I can give myself to you without hesitation, when I can totally and unashamedly be legally yours. That's a tough choice. You're a tough guy. I suppose you're right. Of course I am. I always am. Now give me a kiss and give me say goodnight. He leans in toward her. Ah, no tongues. She allows him to give her the briefest of littlest of baby kisses on the lips before pulling away. Good night, darling. Um. Good night, sweetheart. I love you. I love you too. You, you love me? I love you a lot. I love you too, honey. Mm-hmm. Sweet dreams, darling. Sweet dreams. Good night. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Good night. Later, Elizabeth sings to herself while brushing her hair. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glo the creature enters the room. Ah! The mob makes its way to the castle while the creature takes an unconscious Elizabeth out of the castle. Soon later, Elizabeth wakes up somewhere other than the castle, in the forest outside the castle. Her hair now inexplicably is much longer, and has silver streaks in it that were not there in the previous scene. Where, <clears throat> where am I? She sees the creature still in his tuxedo looking down at her. Ah! Who are you? What, what do you want? What are you going to do to me? Mm. The creature opens his tuxedo jacket. No, no, calm down. I'm not afraid of you. How much do you want me to? How, 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 how much do you want me want to let me go? My father's very rich. You would have the world at your fingertips. Listen, I have to be back by 11:30. I'm expecting a very important call. Mm. Speak! Speak! Why don't you speak? The creature moves around her. What are you doing? You can't be serious! I'm- I'm a- ah! The creature- uh, uh, <clears throat> The creature opens his fly. I'm- uh, uh, Oh my god. Oof. I'm engaged. And what's he 
I didn't. It's never all we. Oh, sweet mystery of life. At last I found you. Oh, at last I know the secret of your arms. A brief reminder that this film was released in 1974. Coincidentally, this sordid scene is played out on page 69 of our script. Anyway... Anyway, the mob continues toward the castle, but they have become quiet, apparently going for a sneak attack. Kemp manually raises his hand as he signals the villagers. Shush! He lowers his prosthetic. Elsewhere in the forest, the creature smokes two cigarettes at the same time and hands one to Elizabeth. It is entirely how clear how he lit them or why he would have any interest in them given his previous encounter with a scar. I mean, I guess sex just does that to a guy. Penny, for your thoughts. Mmm. You're incorrigible, aren't you, you little zipper neck? Mmm. All right, seven has always been my lucky number. Come over here, you hot monster. As the creature turns toward Elizabeth again, the sound of a violin is heard in the night air, and thankfully the creature looks up. What is it? What's the matter? Mm. Is it that music? It's probably just some from some nearby cottage, nothing to worry about. Mercifully, the creature wanders off. Where are you going? Where? Ah! Oh! You men are all alike! Seven or eight quick ones, and then you're off with the boys to boast and brag. You better keep your mouth shut. Oh, I think I love him. Back at the castle, Freddy plays the violin into a speaker system on the roof. Igor sits in front of a music stand holding a horn. It's not a French horn or other conventional orchestral horn. A, an actual horn followed out with whole... It's an actual horn. It's, it's just hollowed out with holes for different notes. It, uh, it probably doesn't have the right embouchure. It, he accompanies Freddy's music while Inga keeps watch and sees the creature approaching. Look, he's coming back. Look, your music. Keep playing. It's the music. It's the music that's bringing him back. Come on. Come. Come on. It's the music, after all. The creature approaches the castle wall and starts climbing a vine up to them. It's unclear why they aren't having him enter through the front door. Come on, you can do it. As the creature reaches the top of the wall, Inga and Igor grab his arms to help him up. Mm. Don't touch him. He wants to do it by himself. You can do it. You can do it. Please, my creation. Please, God, don't touch him. That's already happened enough. The creature succeeds in climbing onto the wall, but as he stands up, he loses his balance. Quick, catch him! Inga and Igor catch the creature as he falls unconscious. Freddy continues playing the violin. Have the preparations been made for the transference? Yes, Doctor. Are you sure you want to go through with this? It's the only thing that can save him now. You realize you're risking both your lives? Yes. They all go to the laboratory, and both Freddy and the creature are put onto operating tables. Metal devices with wires are attached to their heads, and Igor operates the generator through a procedure where Freddy is unconscious. Electricity crackles throughout the room. Switching off. He disables the generator. How will I know they are done? The doctor said to allow 15 minutes, not one second more or less. A large clock attached to the machine ticks down. Outside, the rioters reach the front door, now shouting again. 
apparently no longer feeling that stealth is necessary. How long Rubble. now? Two more minutes. Outside, Inspector Kemp manually raises his right arm and has the rioters pick him up, using him as a battering ram. Ein, zwei, drei. They slam him into the front door, breaking it open, and the villagers charge into the castle. They're rabbling. <laughs> is heard in the lab. What's that noise? I don't know. What time is it? Almost time. The noise draws near. Oh my god, it's the villagers! Just then, Inspector slash Battering Ram Kemp crashes through the laboratory door, held by half a dozen villagers with more behind them. Hello! No, no, please, just another seven seconds! The villagers destroy the machine attached to Freddy and the creature when there is just three seconds left on the countdown clock. No, no, no! She pulls the metal helmet off of Freddy, who remains unconscious. The villagers start picking up the doctor, but it's unclear why they would target him first and not the creature. Regardless, the rabble and Inga's distraught screams. Regardless, the rabble and Inga's distraught screams are interrupted by a booming voice. Put that man down. It's the monster! A I village, said it's the monster! A village elder protests. Oh, it can't be. It is. I said, put that man down. They do so, and Inga undoes the restraints on the creature's body. The seven and a half foot tall frame quickly stands and walks up to Inspector Kemp. And just who do you think you are that you order these people about? I am the monster. Yeah, I see that you are the monster. As long as I can remember, people have hated me. They looked at my face and my body, and they ran away in horror. On the other side of the lab, the housekeeper looks into the lab, tears of joy streaming down her face. In my loneliness, I decided that if I could not inspire love, which was my deepest hope, I would instead cause fear. I live because this poor, half-crazed genius has given me life. He alone held an image of me as something beautiful. And then, when it would have been easy enough to stay out of danger, he used his own body as a guinea pig to give me a calmer brain and a somewhat more sophisticated way of expressing myself. Ah, well, this is, of course, an entirely different situation. <clears throat> As the leader of this community, may I be the first to offer you my hand in friendship. Kemp lifts his prosthetic right hand and extends it toward the creature. The creature accepts, and the villagers applaud. Yeah! All right! Frau Blucher... <laughs> quietly sobs, and she, Frau Blucher that is, <laughs> looks to the heavens. Oh, Victor. Thank you. You are entirely welcome. And now, let us all go to my house for a little sponge cake and a little wine. As Kemp pulls away from the handshake, his prosthetic forearm detaches from his brachium. And shit. To the lumberyard! Yay! 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 Okay, cool! I like lumber. The villagers and Kemp exit in an orderly fashion as the creature Inga and Igor check Freddy's body for a pulse. Apparently, they found one. Because soon later, Freddy 
or at least his body, now in a tux and top hat, Bridal carries Inga, who is in a wedding gown, in the bedroom. Dum da dum da dum 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 dum. Hello, Mrs. Frankenstein. Mrs. Frankenstein, what a beautiful name! Oh, darling. Hold on to your hat. What? Uh, I'll be right back. She exits. And Freddy takes off his tuxedo jacket. Just... I'm holding on to it, darling. Just a few more seconds. Freddy hears Inga singing the tune that he and others have been playing on the violin throughout their journey. And he touches his temples, seemingly disoriented. Elsewhere, the creature sits in a bed wearing a robe and reading a newspaper, with Elizabeth talking to him from the next room over. Honey, honey, I hope you didn't find Daddy's party too boring. He, he did it just for you, and he meant so well. Say you liked it. Mm-hmm. Honey, did you see? I put a special hamper in the bathroom just for your shirts. Oh, and the other one is just for socks and poo-poo undies. Here I come. Elizabeth walks in, her hair now in a tall beehive style, half black and half white. With an animalistic hiss, she approaches the creature playfully and joins him in bed. Back at the castle, Freddy walks toward the bed, his arms extended forward and his movements somewhat stiff as he lays down beside Inga. Mm. Hmm, the feeling is mutual. You know, it's a puzzlement. There's something I've always wanted to ask you about that operation. On the transference part, the monster got part of your wonderful brain. What did you ever get from him? Mm. No, I don't believe... Oh, sweet mystery of life, at last I found you. On the roof. Igor plays a romantic tune on his horn. Thank you for tuning in to our performance of Young Frankenst Frankenstein. Frederick Frankenstein was played by Danny Hill. Igor was played by Casey English. Elizabeth was played by Mary Rivette. Inga was played by Abby Brenner. Inspector Kemp, Victory Frank... Victory. Inspector Kemp, Victor Frankenstein, and Gravekeeper were played by your girl Reach. Harold, MC, Harry, Heidi, and Interrupter were played by Hayes Converse. Frau Blucher... <laughs> Father, Citizen, and Boy were played by Jason Amherst. The Creature, Burgermeister, Mother, Herr Falkstein, and Train Conductor were played by Joel Gutman. Student, Constable, Guard, Helga, Elder, Henrietta, Carlson, and Igor Sr. were played by Leland Queen. Narration was done by me, your host, your ghost host, Cam Griffin. Script adaptation was done by Joel Gutman. Audio engineering was provided by John H. Baker. We are pleased to announce that on Friday, November 17th, we will be doing a special radio drama presentation of Cartoon Network's over the garden wall. Then, on Saturday, November 25th, we will be doing a radio drama presentation of William Shakespeare's The Empire Striketh Back, Star Wars Part the Fifth. The performance will begin at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. For more nerdy content, <clears throat> 
For more nerdy content, please follow Digital Era Entertainment here on Twitch. And you can listen to our past radio drama performances on Digital Era Entertainment's YouTube channel. Once again, thank you for tuning in. We hope you'll join us again next time. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us across social media for updates. Thanks for watching!